ICFRC has host volunteer programs such as this to address topics of international interest for many years. We thank members, volunteers, and interns for making these programs possible since Carver Hawkeye opened in 1983. Maybe we beat Michigan that year, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa's Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their very important financial support. I also want to thank today's special sponsors, Jim and Pat Fgrave, and the U of I Religious Studies Department. Thank you also to City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4. Our format today is the usual one, following our speaker's presentation at about 1 o'clock. Uh, we will have a 15-minute Q&A from written questions uh, from the audience members. Uh, please write those on the index cards found on your tables, and the interns will pick them up. I also want to note that Professor Cole's latest book, The New Arabs, is available for sale at the registration table. Uh, please silence cell phones and any other electric, electronic device. If you have to leave early, uh, please ask that you do so without disturbing uh, others and as quietly as possible. So at this time, it's my pleasure to announce uh, Ahmed Swahea, who will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am very pleased to introduce Juan Cole, uh, the Richard P. Mitchell Professor of History at the University of Michigan. Uh, Professor Cole received his BA in History uh, and Literature of Religions from Northwestern University. He subsequently received an MA in Arabic Study and History from uh, American University in Cairo, and uh, his PhD in Islamic Studies from UCLA. Uh, Professor Cole speaks Arabic, uh, skilled in Persian, Urdu, and reads Turkish. Uh, he has deep knowledge of the languages and cultures of the Middle East uh, and the, def uh, the def deferring theological traditions of Islam have made him an authority on the region. He has been a frequent guest on uh, numerous television programs and he has commented extensively on Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, uh, Egypt, Iraq, and the politics of Pakistan, Afghanistan, Syria, and the Iranian domestic struggles and foreign affairs. Professor Cole has sought to put the relationship of the West and the Muslim world in historical context. He is the author of Engaging the Muslim World and Napoleon's Egypt. His most recent book, The New Arabs, How the Millennial Generation is Changing the Middle East, will be the focus of his remarks today. Please welcome Professor Cole. Thank you, Ahmed, for the warm introduction. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, it's a repeat performance, so I seem not to have crashed and burned the last time. Um, let me just make sure that everybody can hear me. You're sure? I teach students, and some of them sit way in the back of the class. <laughs> One time when we were coming up on an exam, they said, Professor Cole, could you cut us some slack because you were mumbling, we couldn't quite hear you. And I said, well, why were you sitting all the way back there then? Uh, so uh, audiences are not always straight with you. Um, but anyway, good. Everybody says they can hear me. I'll take you at your word. Uh, I want to talk today uh, about uh, a subject that's been consuming me in the last few years, which is uh, the, the millennials in the Arab world in particular, uh, the young people uh, born in the 1980s, 90s, and zeros, um, a, a new generation who are distinctive. They're digital natives, uh, and they give interviews. They complain their parents don't understand them because the parents are not digital natives. Uh, and they... Um, uh, this uh, uh, engagement with the internet has, has um, made it possible for them to form new kinds of friendships and alliances. Uh, 
I met this one young person in, in Egypt who had fair English. And I said, well, you know, did you live in England or the United States for a while? And uh, the young man said, no, no, I, I just um, uh, watched the movies. Uh, and in, in Dubai, they subtitle uh, the English movies in Arabic. So he would uh, read the subtitles and listen to what was being said. And he learned pretty good English this way. Uh, and it's not something that could have been done so easily in 1980s. Um, so um, the Arab year world is young. It's not peculiar in being young. Uh, there are lots of places in the world that are young. India is young. Uh, but um, it is much younger than Europe with regard to median age. So you can see Egypt is 23, Tunisia 31. The Tunisians are a little long in the tooth. Uh, Libya is 28, uh, Syria 24. Not sure you can make an exact correlation with how young they are to how much trouble there's been in the last seven years, but um, uh, there seems to be some correlation. Uh, and um, I remember in the 60s when we had uh, the counterculture, uh, the American median age had gone down to 25. Uh, and it's now, I think, 32 or something. I mean, we're much older than we used to be. Um, so um, if it weren't for, uh, for our immigrants, it would be even uh, higher. Uh, and um, I'll talk about that this evening. So um, these young people are not just a, an age cohort. Uh, the, um, there have been social scientists uh, like the French anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu who has dismissed age as a useful category for social science. Uh, he thought, well, you have young fishermen and young retail workers and young farmers, and what difference does it make that they're young? They're not the same kind of people. They don't li make their living in the same way. And there's, you know, that's a fair critique. On the other hand, because of the internet, uh, I think certain forms of youth culture can now be created and promulgated uh, that go beyond just one's class background. Um, and uh, so these young people networked, it wasn't just on the internet, many of them walked neighborhoods and they did the kind of things that uh, political activists here in the United States do all the time. Uh, but what was remarkable was that they were faced with a situation where they uh, had a lot of sclerotic leaders who had been there most of their lives and weren't uh, stepping down anytime soon, and moreover were preparing their children to take over. Now that's not so unusual in a monarchy where that's what you would expect as the children would take over, but these were republics. So um, my professor, Saadine Ibrahim, a great uh, human rights activist in Egypt, got into trouble. He, he, he coined a word. He said, monarpublicanism, jumlukia. Uh, so uh, uh, these are regimes where the sons were going to succeed their fathers. And it happened in Syria. Uh, but it was expected to happen in Egypt and Yemen and Libya. Uh, the ruler of Tunisia, Ben Ali, did not have a son, but he had a, a very powerful son-in-law, uh, and probably he was being uh, groomed. So um, uh, it didn't happen. All of that series of children who were in the wings waiting to take over, they're not going to take over. Some of them are in jail. Some of them are in exile. And why? Because the youth put their feet down. They said, we're not going to be inherited like so many sticks of furniture. This is a republic. And um, while I think a lot of Western observers thought that these youth revolutions were mainly about democracy, and finally, you know, the Arabs would become like Eisenhower Americans. Uh, um, that's probably not what was in their minds, 
they wanted jobs. They wanted a different kind of economy. They, they were worried about corruption. Uh, but they minded most of all uh, that they were increasingly as republics being ruled by families. If you make a revolution, there's always a possibility of a counter-revolution. And that's largely what happened uh, in, um, in most of the countries where, where the government was overthrown, where the president for life was uh, gotten rid of and his children were no longer in line. Nevertheless, the elite cracked down. Uh, and um, uh, I have one Egyptian f friend who's an activist who said that, uh, you know, it, it was um, like if you have a, a disease uh, that can be cured by an injection, but they don't give you quite enough, and then the disease comes back twice as bad. So that's what happened to us in Egypt. Uh, so um, uh, uh, General uh, Field Marshal uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi made a coup in 2013 in, in Egypt. Uh, alleging that it was actually in alliance with the youth movement against the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, which had come to power in elections. Um, but then once he got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood, he turned on the youth. The Long Knives came out, and they put them in jail and cracked down on them. And now Egypt is very calm, very calm, <laughs> way too calm. Uh, and um, uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, very cleverly and s sinisterly uh, pulled up tanks and fired into peaceful crowds who were protesting and uh, killed the youth. And they then had a choice of giving up or picking up a gun and fighting back. And of course, they were angry because their siblings and friends had been killed in this way, merely for protesting. So al-Assad turned the Syrian revolution into a civil war. And then, in a civil war, it's not the moderate, nice people who come to the fore. I mean, if you're George Patton uh, said nobody ever wins a war by dying for his country, you win a war by making the other poor bastard die for his country. Uh, and. Uh, it's the bastards that come out uh, that in, in these in these situations. So um, uh, increasingly, the the people who wanted liberal democracy on the French model in Syria ended up being refugees in uh, in Europe, uh, and uh, who was still on the battlefield uh, were these uh, seedy guerrillas, and 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 you needed money, you needed guns, and where would you get them? Was from the Gulf. And then the Gulf said, well, we could give you some money, but you don't seem to have a beard. You know, don't pray regularly. You don't have the discourse of Al-Qaeda. And so gradually the rebels were turned from being people who wanted more civil liberties in Syria to being Al-Qaeda. And then ISIL arose. Uh, and uh, al-Assad was really happy about this. Never attacked ISIL very much. Very happy to have it there, because he could go to Paris and say, oh, ISIL seems to be blowing you up these days. Don't you need somebody to stand between you and them? And I volunteer. Uh, so uh, al-Assad won in this way, uh, polarizing, deliberately pol polarizing the public uh, was one of the techniques. Uh, and then in Yemen, the deposed President Ali Abdullah Saleh, behind the scenes made an alliance with a tribal group of uh, Yemeni Shiites who felt badly used and came back to power uh, uh, on their backs. Uh, um, so all of these youth revolutions were crushed uh, by the 60-somethings, um, except for Tunisia. Uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. The international situation also was against them. Uh, the, the Middle East is a place where uh, uh, petroleum interests speak with a loud voice. And uh, one of the millennials uh, was on the other side, Mohammed bin Salman, who's probably the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia as a, a 
uh, I, I think he's 32, um, and uh, he gave money to the Egyptian officer corps to crush uh, the youth movement. Uh, the Saudis, you know, they're an absolute monarchy, uh, probably more powerful than Louis XIV, who, who said the, supposedly the state is, is I, uh, l'état c'est moi. Probably didn't say that, but might, might as well have. Uh, and, uh, but it is true of Mohammed bin Salman and his father, uh, King Salman, the state is them, uh, is they. And um, so um, uh, a lot of oil money from the Gulf uh, went into conservatism, neoconservatism, and crushing uh, these, these populist movements. Well, uh, the youth um, uh, of the contemporary Arab world uh, have been polled. And uh, I think a, a lot of Americans would be surprised as to how they feel about the world. Uh, they see uh, the rise of, uh, of uh, ISIL, or Daesh, as they call it in the Middle East, uh, as uh, one of the most severe problems uh, the region has. Uh, this idea that a lot of Americans seem to have, uh, and I saw it in politicians and journalists, that somehow ISIL was popular in the Middle East, is not true. Uh, they were a laughing stock for people that were relatively distant from them, and they were deeply feared by people who were anywhere near, near them. Uh, and um, uh, so, again, the threat of terrorism, almost 40% of the youth say that's a very high, uh, a, a very severe problem. Uh, but then, what's after terrorism and ISIL? Unemployment. The Middle East uh, has this shape I, I mentioned of being unusually young. What does it mean? You have millions of people in the region coming on the job market every year, turning 18 or 22 if they went to college, and looking for a job. And for reasons that are not entirely clear, the Middle East is one of the uh, most disadvantaged regions in the world with regard to foreign direct investment. FDI is a very prominent uh, um, statistic that's used by the World Bank, uh, and FDI in the Middle East is nothing to write home about. Uh, it could be, you know, you had a lot of Arab-Israeli wars, and then you had other kinds of conflict. Um, but then you had those kinds of problems in South America and Southeast Asia and so forth, but uh, that doesn't seem to have stopped the foreign investment coming in. Uh, so we can't entirely explain why this should have been, but the Middle East very low in FDI, and I think that's one of the reasons that the uh, job creation is so slow. I think there's also an unusual amount of corruption in the region, although again, you know, Korea ended up being the 12th largest economy in the world, South Korea did, and if you go back before 1989, it was a corrupt military dictatorship, so how, how did it or, you know, uh, do well when, when Egypt, which probably in 1945, Egypt and South Korea were very similar societies, Egypt fell way behind in many ways. Um, so, but anyway, th these young people are really worried about uh, unemployment. Uh, the, uh, a third of them are worried about civil unrest. I, I think that must be the third that didn't come out into the streets because they were the ones who were making civil unrest. Um, a rising cost of living that goes along with being afraid about unemployment, uh, and um, lack of strong political leadership, lack of Arab unity, lack of democracy, only a little over a quarter think that's the really big problem for them is lack of democracy. Uh, so um, they, uh, they have this kind of very local concerns. Are we secure? <laughs> Are terrorists going to get us? Uh, do we have good governance? Are we going to find a job? Uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, the American impression of the Middle East is that it's full of religious fanatics. 
the impression of the middle of America in the Middle East is that America is full of religious fanatics. <laughs> Uh, uh, neither thing is true. Uh, there are there are religious fanatics in both areas, but um, uh, the the, the uh, myths about the Middle East are easily dispelled if you look at the opinion polling and actual behavior. I think often people who look at the Middle East from 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 the West um, uh, misunderstand. Uh, the kinds of religious practices that people have. So uh, uh, we now have all these stereotypes about Muslims. If a man wears a beard, then he's, you know, be careful, check him for bombs and so forth. Uh, and uh, I don't think the beard, you know, through history has had that kind of, of connotation, and it doesn't in the contemporary Middle East either. Uh, although, in some places, like Egypt, they're adopting Western stereotypes. So my friends in Egypt who had beards, you know, they've, they've been, they've, some, some of them have been harassed uh, because people assume them that they're religious fundamentalists. But there is, uh, uh, there is a tendency for some religious people in the in Middle East to express themselves with their appearance. And so uh, pious women would, uh, would cover their hair at least, and uh, men, men sometimes will insist on having a beard. Uh, but um, uh, a lot of that is an expression of conventional religiosity. So it doesn't necessarily mean they have a religious ideology or that they want a theocracy or that they're terrorists. They may just think it's nice to go to mosque every once in a while. Um, um, people who go regularly to uh, uh, religious places of worship in the United States are not usually coded as dangerous. Uh, and so a lot of the, their counterparts in the Middle East also are not. You know, Americans have been telling Gallup, uh, the polling agency, since 1945 that 44% of them go to church on Sunday. We social scientists entertain the severest doubts as to whether <laughs> this polling result is correct. Um, uh, it, it seems to be that in some instances, people tell pollsters uh, what they think their behavior ought to have been rather than what it actually is. Uh, there, were, uh, there were a couple of sociologists who went to a small town in Georgia and followed people around on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, to IHOP and so forth, and um, uh, <laughs> estimated that in that town, maybe 33% were going to church. And if that was true in a small town in Georgia, I guarantee you it's much less than the rest of the country. So, uh, but nevertheless, we don't think badly of those people. And we even seem to want to exaggerate <laughs> the degree to which we do that. Now, when people go to mosque in the Middle East, it's the same thing. They, they don't think of that as dangerous or uh, as fundamentalist or as political necessarily. Uh, but, on the other hand, uh, a lot of youth um, uh, are not happy with the state of Islam. Uh, and so, for instance, both in Palestine and Morocco, polling showed that 6 in 10 felt that a, 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 a thoroughgoing reform of Islam is necessary. And I can tell you, in Palestine and, and Morocco, they did not mean reform in the direction of extremism. They wanted something that was more modern. Uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, getting up towards 100% in some cases of respondents in eight Arab countries among youth said that movements like ISIS and Al-Qaeda are either a complete conversion, uh, perversion of Islam or that they are mostly wrong. Uh, and they see. People's motives, if you ask them, well, why is somebody joining ISIL? Why is somebody joining Al-Qaeda? They don't say, well, because they're pious. They don't say, well, because this is the true Islam. They've already said that's a perversion of Islam. They say it's because they feel oppressed. It's political. They're joining it for the same reason people used to join the Communist Party. They would feel like they were not being well treated. Um, I was interested to see polling in 2016 and 2017 about their attitudes towards the United States. 
uh, our mm, international profile, because the pollsters have this language, are you favorable or unfavorable towards a country? Uh, unfavorability rating of the United States has increased very substantially. Now, admittedly, it was never very high in the Arab world where there's a, a long-standing critique of U.S. foreign policy. Most Arab respondents think of the U.S., they think of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Uh, they think of, um, uh, from their point of view, the U.S. is uh, daily helping uh, the, uh, the screwing over of the Palestinians. Uh, and uh, the U.S. has taken a lot of very unpopular uh, un, uh, stances in the region. Uh, so that's, there's always, you know, a certain amount of negative responses. But not everywhere and all the time. Uh, the U.S. has favorable responses as well, uh, particularly favorable in the past in places like Morocco and uh, uh, Jordan uh, and so forth, but, um, and the Gulf. But the opinion polling shows that um, something seems to have happened last November um, <laughs> that caused it to go way down. So 70% of these young people uh, in 3,500 were, were polled uh, believe that President Trump is anti-Muslim. Uh, and uh, whereas in, 30, in 2016, under Obama, 32% said that the U.S. is an enemy. Uh, in uh, spring of 2017, 49% thought that the U.S. is something of an enemy uh, uh, or a strong enemy. Uh, and in some countries, like e Egypt and Iraq, Lebanon, it, it rises above 50%. Uh, that see the U.S. as an enemy. That's a problem. We have 10,000 troops in Iraq. So uh, they are trying to help the Iraqi government uh, save itself from ISIL, and they have largely succeeded by now. I don't know if you heard. It doesn't seem to be widely being reported in the U.S. press, but ISIL has been largely defeated. Uh, uh, we didn't get the V-Day parade. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, despite the U.S. help against ISIL and uh, the U.S. Uh, troops being put back into Iraq, uh, uh, there are several thousand there. There's a revived Iraqi command, and U.S. pilots are flying close air support for Iraqi troops. Uh, to have over 50 percent of Iraqis feel like we're the enemy uh, is highly undesirable in this situation. Um, Likewise, uh, in 2016, 63% of young Arabs said they thought the United States was a friend. I think that would come to, as a shock to a lot of people. Mm, unfortunately, it was a fleeting moment <laughs> because 46% now say we're a friend. Actually, that's actually not so bad given what's going on, uh, that, uh, that nearly half of them still think that we're friends. Um, I'm not sure they're right about that. But um, uh, so let me back up and talk a little bit about how we got to where we are uh, with these re youth revolutions that broke out in uh, 2011 and after, uh, and why. Um, as you could see from the polling, they're very upset about corruption. And uh, for them, it's personal. Because when you go looking for a job, um, maybe you don't get that job if you're not a member of the ruling party. Or maybe if you're not friends with the circle of the president, you don't get the job. Or maybe there's a business license involved for small entrepreneurs, and you can't get the license because you went on Facebook and criticized the ruler. So that's the kind of thing they mean by corruption, is where people in public office are throwing public resources to private individuals on the basis of private relationships. I know it's, it's hard for an American audience to conceive of such a thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there's even more of it over there than there is here. Uh, and uh, uh, moreover, a lot of public goods in the Middle East have been being privatized. Uh, this theory of the Washington consensus or neoliberalism, it's often called, 
which is that the market is a much better distributor of goods, uh, much more efficient uh, than government policy is. Also had a big impact on the Middle East, not just in the West. And um, uh, a pernicious impact. Uh, you can tell I'm, I don't actually think the market is a very good distributor of certain kinds of goods. If you were interested that people had read <laughs> the dialogues of Socrates, not sure the market can get you there. Uh, and moreover, if you were interested in young people being able to afford to study the dialogues of Socrates, I also don't think the market is mainly going to get you there. Uh, the market might decide that they get out of college with $150,000 in debt. Uh, so this privatization of public goods doesn't in the real world actually work in every instance. There may be areas where it works. There may be some parts of life where the market is a useful way of indexing things. But it's not universal, and it's certainly not true of water. I mean, shouldn't water be a human right? Shouldn't you always be able to get a drink of water, whether you could afford it or not? Um, so um, nevertheless, in the Middle East, marketization has, has proceeded apace. And um, since these had been in the Cold War era, uh, often these states, Egypt and Iraq and so forth, had tilted towards the Soviet Union. They had really huge public sectors, and admittedly probably unduly huge. Uh, as, as much as 50% of the economy would be in public hands. Uh, and, um, but that's all been being sold off. And the, and the problems is that the neoliberals, when they thought, well, we'll sell off the, the public uh, companies and things, make them private and make them more efficient, uh, they didn't seem to be thinking in the real world. So I'll give you an example. In Egypt, there was a, uh, a state-owned steel mill in the 90s. And then there was a privately-owned steel mill. A privately-owned steel mill was owned by a, a man who became a billionaire, billionaire uh, Ahmed Az. And Az gravitated to the circle of Hosni Mubarak and the dictatorship, and then was given even more <coughs> perquisites and licenses. And then in 2004, when the International Monetary Fund and Washington and Paris all pressured Hosni Mubarak to privatize the state-owned steel mill, uh, the son of Mubarak calls up Ahmed Az and said, uh, you know, we're thinking of uh, privatizing the state-owned steel mill. Would you like to buy it? <laughs> so Az said, well, yeah, you know, I could take it off your hands. That was his only competition. And then what did he do? Is he gradually fired everybody there and moved all the assets over to his steel, steel company. So now he has a complete monopoly on steel in Egypt. And he's best friends with the president and the president's son. So any future licenses, any question of importing steel, all that's going to go through him. So that's what privatization looked like in Egypt. I don't think the World Bank, you know, had this in mind. Uh, and the youth knew it and, and blogged about it, and they were very upset. Uh, and, uh, of course, there was also a lot of just mindless repression. I think of mindless repression as uh, a kind of ethos of repression that, that sometimes <coughs> becomes adopted by governments. Like, if somebody was plotting to overthrow you, then it may not be a good thing or it may not be ethical, but you could understand arresting them. But if in the Middle East, little groups like this one who are interested like as citizens in, in government policy could be harassed, you know. So, uh, Egypt had a, a law that you couldn't uh, gather uh, in more than a certain number. Or if you did gather, you had to have government permission. And people would go to like restaurants and places which had space to gather and say, could we please gather here and talk about issues? And the owner would say, no, no, the secret police visited me this morning and warned me against that. So even just having a space in the society where you could meet in fair numbers 
was impossible. And some of the first protests in Egypt, the young people uh, protested um, horizontally. They, uh, they would stand by the Nile uh, on, on the uh, Corniche, uh, uh, which is a nice place to walk and so forth, and it's straight. But they would stand five feet apart from one another, and there would be this long line of them. Because if you had five people who met in public, the police could arrest you. Uh, if they're all together. So they, they had to be five feet apart from one another. So they, they had the, the horizontal protest. Uh, uh, initially, after a while, they just told the police to jump in a lake and did what they wanted. But um, then uh, some of this mindless protest, uh, the mindless repression, I meant to say, uh, turned violent. And uh, you know, young people in the Arab world, uh, young men in particular who were in public, were always being harassed by the police. Um, it didn't matter, they didn't, you know, Egypt doesn't have much in the way of ethnicity. There are mostly Sunni Arabs. There are about 10% Coptic Christians that you can't tell by looking. But if you were young and male and you were on the street, police would be patting you down. They would be taunting you. They would be suggesting you go elsewhere, go home, uh, and so forth. And um, uh, because of the high unemployment, uh, some of the youth developed something of a counterculture. So there was a young man in Alexandria, Khaled Said, who had studied in the West a bit, but I think he was kind of a college dropout uh, or hadn't decided what he wanted to do in life. And uh, um, there are allegations that he became involved in uh, human rights work uh, and that he got a hold of a, of a videotape because people were using their smartphones to film the police doing horrible things to people, uh, and that the police got wind of this. So they went to an internet cafe and uh, arrested him and brought him down into the alley and then beat him within an inch of his life and then ultimately took the inch away too and killed him. Uh, they may not have meant to bash his head in quite so badly, uh, but he was dead. So uh, the family had to come and claim the body from the morgue and uh, one of the brothers took a picture of the bashed-in face uh, surreptitiously and put it up on Facebook. And for one reason or another, this just caught fire in, among youth in Egypt. Uh, Khaled Said was one of them, right? He'd been, done some college, he'd been in the West, he was uh, a modern kind of person. Maybe it's not clear exactly why the police went after him, but it may have been that he was, uh, he, he was uh, investigating them. Uh, and so uh, some smart young people who were internet savvy put up a Facebook page for Khaled Said uh, that ultimately got hundreds of thousands and even millions of likes. Um, it was a very brave thing to do because when you like something, you, your like is there. The police, there were cyber police that were kind of looking into who was being a dissident. Uh, but um, a, a lot of cyber activism grew up around this Khalid Said against police brutality. So the Egyptian Revolution of 2011 happened on police day, ironically. The youth called the revolution f on January 25th, which was a day set aside to honor the Egyptian police. And of course, on that day, the police got to stay home. So what better way to honor them uh, than to come out in the thousands in downtown Cairo? Uh, but they were able to do that because the police weren't expecting such a big crowd, and they weren't around. They were off. Uh, and, um, but so the, the Egyptian Revolution began as a, as a protest against police brutality. And they wanted the interior ministry a minister to step down. In the Middle East, uh, in much of the world, the interior minister doesn't deal with trees very much. Um, that's uh, more like our uh, FBI or Homeland Security or uh, organs that, thankfully, so far at least, we don't have, the secret police and so forth. So uh, they wanted that guy gone. And uh, young people told me in Egypt, they said, we hadn't imagined that we could actually get rid of the president altogether. It was, uh, it was the interior minister that we were after. Um, Tunisia also was a catalyst. Tunisia was the first place where a revolution succeeded in chasing the, the uh, president out of the country. Again, there was a, a martyr figure uh, uh, who became <coughs> famous, uh, uh, Mohamed Bouazizi, 
who may actually have been named Tarek Bouazizi, and got there was a Facebook mix-up, and um, uh, who was said to have been a college graduate that couldn't get a job, but he wasn't. He was a high school graduate who couldn't get a job, and who was selling vegetables, and and was bothered in the street by the uh, by the police, uh, and uh, uh, he was supporting his family. He felt despair, and he went to City Hall and stood in front of it and put a can of gasoline on himself and set a, a match and, and set himself a fire. Uh, and um, uh, that set off a whole set of, of protests, mainly in small towns in the south and center of the country, away from the capital, uh, which then spread towards the capital and ultimately had 200,000 people in the streets of, of Tunis, the capital. Uh, and um, the president is said to have gone to the chief of staff of the army and said, you need to put these crowds down. And the chief of staff uh, looked at him and said, Mr. President, I'm not going to shoot the Tunisian people for you. Well, when your chief of staff tells you that, you might as well start the helicopter going right there. <laughs> uh, so, so apparently they told him that they would take him to Paris and let things cool off people around him. So they put him on a plane. But then Paris said, no, no, we don't. we've got 800,000 Tunisians. We don't want any trouble. So they had to call around for some place to land. And the only place that would take him was Saudi Arabia. So he's in Jeddah now. Um, he had spent his career, Ben Ali, the dictator, sort of telling the West he would stand up to is Islam for them. So the idea of him living in Saudi Arabia is delicious to a lot of Tunisians. Uh, um, and there was a lot of, uh, I'm going to go through this because we're coming to the end of our ta uh, time. I just wanted to show you some pictures. This is a, uh, a celebration of a, uh, of a neighborhood in Tunis, uh, and it's a youth celebration. So uh, uh, you can't hear it, but there's rock music in the background. And people are doing graffiti on the, on the, on the, uh, on the streets uh, and um, selling their art and so forth. And I thought this picture... Uh, sort of exemplifies contemporary Tunisia. Because you have a, a, a demand for gay pride, and that's very controversial in the Arab world. Right now in Egypt, there's a big crackdown on, uh, you're not allowed to show the rainbow flag and, and, and people are being arrested. Uh, but it's not the case so much in Tunisia. So you have gay pride, and then you have a mosque, and then you have a, a, a celebration of uh, free Tunisia, uh, democratic Tunisia. So that's, uh, kind of where their heads ended up being. Um, the United States, uh, I think, was thrown by a, for a loop by all this. In the Bush administration, you had had a kind of demand that the uh, Middle East democratize. And uh, they had told Bush to jump in a lake, and they weren't going to do it. And then Obama got elected, and he said, knock yourselves out. Do what you want. I don't care. They said, we're going to democratize. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, uh, Obama, you know, had tried to make up with Bashar al-Assad and uh, open an embassy in Syria, and he had good relations with Hosni Mubarak, and all of a sudden everything was a big question mark. I don't, I, I think they just kind of tried to ride the tiger. Uh, and um, uh, now we've got a president who uh, is, is the opposite of Bush. If Bush was muscular Wilsonianism, uh, uh, our current president says that Arabs, you know, they need a strong man. Um, he's not a systematic thinker, and so has, <laughs> has made statements on several sides of some of these issues. But at one point, he seemed to say that it was fine with him if Bashar al-Assad stayed in power in Syria, and indeed if, if the Russians kind of just took it over as their sphere of influence. Um, I'm not sure why he thought he could give away Syria. Uh, but and then he's been happy with uh, with uh, General Sisi in Egypt and uh, um, did the sword dance with the uh, the Saudi rulers. Uh, uh, he said kept saying he was afraid of Muslims, but then he was there and they all had the swords and they were dancing together. So I don't think he really is uh, afraid. Um, so, but if you had to say what our current policy it is, it seems to be support the strongmen against the youth. Thank you very much. The uh, first question is, how have women's rights fared? 
So with regard to uh, women's rights in the Arab world, um, I would say that ironically enough, and despite the counter-revolution and the human rights crackdown, um, women have come out of this with a somewhat improved position in many of these countries, uh, at least on paper. Uh, so uh, Morocco is a monarchy, uh, but it's a constitutional monarchy to some extent. Uh, and it did experience some youth uh, demonstrations in 2011 that were sufficiently vigorous to put a scare into the government. And so the king, uh, who's a younger man and very well educated, uh, uh, designed a new constitution, uh, which certainly, again, on paper is a big improvement over the old one with regard to human rights and so forth, but uh, which uh, says that women are equal to men. Uh, likewise, in Tunisia, there was a huge debate over the language in the Constitution because um, uh, a, uh, a right of center religious party for a while got in, the Nahda. Uh, and um, on the other hand, a lot of Tunisians are you know, French educated and very modern kind of people. And they wanted, uh, the, the women marched in the streets and they wanted a provision in the Constitution that said women are equal to men. Uh, and ultimately, the women won. Uh, even the, the more, I wouldn't say fundamentalist, but the more religious right party agreed to allow there to be a provision in the Constitution for the equality of women and men. Since women and men are not equal in Tunisian statute law with regard to inheritance and all kinds of things, I mean, this is a bonanza for lawyers for the next 100 years because there are going to be a lot of lawsuits and it has to be, you know, what, what this provision of the Constitution means has to be adjudicated. Uh, but that wasn't there before. I mean, Tunisia was better on women's rights than most other Arab countries, but to have a, a, an explicit statement in the Constitution that they're equal uh, was unprecedented. Likewise, in Egypt, uh, there are provisions in the Constitution for women's rights that are new. Um, uh, and so that's in the countries that where you had big youth movements and, and reform and so forth. And I think, although I'm saying it's mainly on paper, there are actual real world improvements in women's status and, as a result of these revolutions. Um, and for one thing, even where you've had a counter revolution like in Egypt under Sisi, Sisi knows that 50% of his population are women and they are constituents for him. Uh, and he does have to be elected, although it's kind of a phony election, but he, he wants that constituency. And so he has come out for uh, certain kinds of women's rights. He, he, he you know, implemented punishment for sexual harassment uh, for the first time. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that he's a feminist uh, or that, you know, he's a good guy or anything, but there are political reasons for which maybe he's taking some of these stances. At the same time, in, in the countries which didn't have uh, a, a successful revolution in Syria and Iraq, you had the rise of ISIL, which was hyper, I mean, misogynist and enslaved women and wanted you know, concubines back and uh, uh, really reduced women to the lowest possible status. Um, that experiment is coming to an end now at the point of a gun. Uh, both in Iraq and in Syria, but it was a, a, a real shock for Arab women that you could have such a reactionary movement. Uh, and I, I think, you know, you have to say the women won this one as well. Please. Okay. Uh, why is Egypt quiet, perhaps, due to um, severe repression and torture, or is it for some other reason or in addition to those two reasons? Yeah. Well, a lot of the quiet in Egypt is because of severe repression and torture. Um, is dangerous to put your head up uh, at the moment, just as it was, I mean, maybe even worse than it was in 20, 2009, 2010, before the revolution. Uh, the army and the secret police have come back with a vengeance, and they're even more vigilant now that they know what can happen to them if people can get up a successful movement. On the other hand, some of the quiet. Uh, is because people were traumatized by the events of the revolution and by the uncertainty of it. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood came to power uh, through elections in 2012, uh, and Egyptians are not uh, fundamentalists. Uh, they, uh, you know, all the opinion polling shows this. They're just 
uh, they, they, they made one chant in Egypt. They, they said, uh, they, addressing Muslim Brotherhood parliamentarians, they said, Ya katat ni wal eriyan, Egypt land takun Iran. Uh, you guys in parliament who are Muslim brother, Egypt is never going to be like Iran. Uh, they, d they didn't want that. Uh, and so when, uh, last time I was in Egypt, I was talking to a fairly wide range of people about what had happened. And they said, you know, we felt under the Muslim Brotherhood, we felt like we were in jail. Uh, we had this very fundamentalist uh, uh, regime and we didn't know where it might take us, what kind of liberties it might take away from people. And of course, women were particularly worried because the Muslim Brotherhood is very patriarchal. So uh, then they, f they said when we had the coup, we felt, well, they didn't call it a coup, uh, July Revolution. Uh, when we had the July Revolution, we felt like we'd been let out of jail. Uh, so we look at them and we say, well, gee, you guys have gone under military dictatorship, which overthrew an elected government. They say, oh, no, the elected government was the dictatorship. Now we've got more liberty. So um, uh, not everybody feels this way, but a lot of people do. So there's a kind of um, uh, silent majority, I think, that uh, not so unhappy to have the, the army back in control. And if you're not a human rights activist and you're just going a, a, along with your daily life, then you know nothing bad is likely to happen to you. So uh, the, the repression works alongside with this kind of feeling that Egypt dodged a bullet that you could have gotten this hardline fundamentalist government uh, instead. Can you tell us a little bit about the responses in Iran following Trump's recent uh, decertification? <coughs> well, the Iranians uh, uh, have responded to Trump's decertification of the nuclear deal. Uh, the President Rouhani has spoken and uh, uh, the foreign minister, uh, Mohammad Javad uh, Zarif, has spoken. Um, they uh, uh, complained that uh, our current president seems to be extremely erratic. Um, and uh, that it, uh, it's difficult for them to uh, understand exactly what he's going on about. Since Iran is, in fact, in compliance with the deal and has been so certified by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And, you know, people say, well, maybe they're cheating. But I don't think the people who say that know so much about all this. And it's not like I'm an expert either. But I, I have followed it uh, just as a layperson. And, you know, if you uh, create plutonium, it it's, creates a signature that can be detected. And it's not a signature that goes away anytime soon. Uh, it's not like you can spray air freshener and people can't detect the plutonium anymore. And this happened in Pakistan that the IAEA caught them out with some plutonium. So um, they're being regularly inspected and the deal allows them to do snap inspections and no signatures. They're not making anything dangerous. Uh, plus, in, in order to make very much of fissile material, you need thousands and thousands of centrifuges, but we made them go down to only 6,000. Um, and um, one of the really easy ways to make a bomb, and probably North Korea did this, is to have a heavy water breeder reactor. You know, they put those rods to keep the uh, uh, thing from blowing up uh, in the water, and um, the fissile material builds up on the rods, and you can harvest it in a heavy water reactor, and it builds up fairly quickly and you know, can get enough of the material to make a small bomb fairly soon if you have a heavy water reactor. A light water reactor, you could theoretically do this, but it's not easy and it would take a long time and, and so forth. So uh, they were going to make a heavy water reactor. That was the most suspicious thing in my view that they were going to do in Iran. And uh, as part of this agreement, they mothballed that reactor. They bricked it in. There's no reactor. Uh, they have no way of making a bomb. So they've been certified. You know, they're, they're not in, in violation. And the Europeans, the Chinese, the Russians, um, none of whom are, you know, without a suspicious side to their character. Uh, uh, none of them f feel as Trump does. Um, and in the, in the decertification, uh, which was apparently actually written by Nikki Haley, um, has full sentences and, and so forth. Um, uh, it, um, 
Uh, it doesn't actually accuse Iran of uh, of being in violation of, of the deal. I mean, the provisions of the deal are never mentioned. It says, well, they're making a ballistic missile, not in the deal. Uh, they're supporting Hezbollah, not in the deal. So that decertification decree was complaints about Iran's behavior in every other dimension but the deal. Uh, so the Iranians are aware of this, and uh, they have re responded in, in a very adult manner. They said, you know, we're in this deal. We made it with the, the permanent members of the UN Security Council. As long as Europe adheres to it, we will. Uh, and um, so as for Europe, well, you know what Angela Merkel thinks. And, uh, and uh, uh, Macron in France uh, just announced that, um, that uh, Trump had made a very serious error and that uh, Macron's response is that he thinks he probably is going to go to Tehran in the spring. Good. Um, last question here is, can you elaborate, that's a, obviously a complicated question, but uh, a little on the uh, specifics on the type of reform of Islam sought by those who favor it in the Mideast? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the debates on the reform of Islam in the Middle East um, center uh, a lot of them around how to interpret the tradition. Uh, and um, so just just give you an example of uh, the Quran says that if you have a court proceeding of some sort and um, uh, you only have one witness who is a woman and it's against a male perpetrator, that wouldn't be sufficient to convict. You need two women to overrule the word of one man. That's what's in the Quran. So uh, people in the Middle East, just as the United States, you know, a lot of our law comes from the Ten Commandments, and uh, uh, some percentage of Americans think that should be our Constitution uh, when you ask them in polling. Uh, a lot of people in the Middle East, when they're setting up their civil law for their states, they're going to look to the Quran for values and so forth. So the question arises, you know, should, should you need two women to overrule a man in a court proceeding? And uh, the modernists would say, well, you know, in the seventh century, it's not like these women had PhDs. Uh, they were relatively sheltered people and um, maybe not people of the world. They didn't, weren't the ones who went to the bazaar and did shopping and, and uh, interacted with people and didn't give public speeches. So, of course, you know, they weren't in a position to uh, uh, testify against uh, uh, a man who maybe, you know, traveled widely and was educated and so forth. But nowadays things have changed. And so you could have a very educated woman who's testifying against a man who was perfectly articulate and able to make her case and ought to be allowed to do so. So do you take historical context into account when you interpret the Quran or the sayings and doings of the prophet? Well, and you know, these kinds of debates are not foreign to, to Christianity either. Mm. How many women who go to church here wear a veil uh, and avoid speaking up uh, when they're there? <laughs> because that's what's in the New Testament, right? Uh, but uh, Jimmy Carter has given you permission. Uh, and uh, uh, so I would say some of the youth want a more Jimmy Carter kind of uh, uh, Islam uh, that, that's uh, able to, to, to deal with, uh, with current uh, issues uh, and which uses more reason in uh, approaching the text and not just, you know, if they, they, the, the, the old joke about the Christian fundamentalist is that Jesus is a door, then surely he has a doorknob. Uh, and they don't want that. Uh, but, and that kind of Islam, of course, is the one that is championed by Saudi Arabia, a very hardline fundamentalist, literalist kind of Islam. And it wouldn't be very important because there are only 20 million Saudis and uh, uh, they're not uh, that influential in people's lives, except for the oil money. And they can use the oil money to go around and make mosques and buy uh, imams and sort of promote their, it would be almost as if, you know, uh, uh, American Christianity became hostage to people who lived in the oil states of this country and where a lot of money was involved in the more fundamentalist side of the religion. 
Well, there is one more last very important question, and that is where are you speaking tonight and when? I'm what you're saying. It's, it's, come, come to the microphone because yeah. they can't hear. <laughs> The Siemens Center, uh, 15.05, 7.30 tonight. And that does conclude in um, our program today. So let's give a very loud. But before we adjourn, I've got a couple of tasks. One is to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the U of I Honors Program, the U of I Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation for their generous support, and also today's financial sponsors, Jim and Pat Efgrave, and the U of I Religious Studies Department and City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. And Professor Cole, well, you've been here before, you now perhaps are the owner of two of our very <laughs> coveted uh, Iowa City Foreign Relations mug. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned.